Okay, so we uh, did talk about uh, LTI systems, uh, linear uh, time invariant systems in the past, and I think I uh, ended saying that uh, filters uh, are uh, a good example of an, uh, of an LTI system. So I think it's always a good idea to then just make one. And uh, in this case, we make a very simple filter with just two electronic components. But before we go into that, I wanted to uh, explain a few generic things about filters. And if you look at um, a filter uh, characteristic, you typically look at uh, the frequency and uh, the amplitude. And what a filter typically does is that certain frequencies he will kind of pass unattenuated and other frequencies it will attenuate. So let's kind of uh, take an example. Let's say that this filter is uh, passing the low frequencies uh, uh, un uh, unaltered and the high frequencies uh, uh, it will uh, attenuate. Ideally, of course, this line would be straight, but sometimes there is a little bit of a ripple on there. And of course, ideally, uh, we would have kind of a brick wall here, but uh, that also is uh, usually not the case. And if you want to know, actually, there is one appendix that talks about it, why that's not possible. So we have a uh, transition band uh, that is uh, uh, indicated by this uh, slope here. Now, typically, this area is called the pass band. And this area is called the stop band. And then in between there, we have the transition uh, area. And let's kind of look what that filter would be doing. Uh, let's kind of look into the passband, let's say here, at this particular frequency. That would mean that I would have a frequency of that particular uh, value here, and I would put that in my uh, filter. And this is my filter. My, uh, in this case, it's a white box, but you can consider it a black box. And then basically what that filter would do, I'll try to uh, draw it as uh, good as possible. It's not very good, but what that filter would do is basically it would pass this frequency unattenuated at its output. Right? So this is a value of uh, approximately 1. In contrast, so that would be uh, happening in the pass band here that well, I indicated with that little x there. If I, uh, if I would look into the stop band, let's say here, at this little dot here, I would have a much higher frequency, eh, because this frequency is much higher, so I would uh, feed this much higher frequency into my uh, filter. And this would be the same filter, but at, uh, now we basically look into this uh, situation where we have the stop band. And now what would be the output is uh, the same frequency, but much more attenuated. And if I did this for uh, a bunch of frequencies uh, across this uh, axis, and for every frequency I would look at uh, what's going in and what's going out, I would be able to produce this plot. And that would be the filter characteristic or the frequency characteristic of this uh, particular filter. Now this is an, um, a filter that passes, uh, as you can see, low frequencies mainly unattenuated and starts to attenuate the higher frequencies. And, uh, and so that characteristic uh, typically uh, you would say is a low pass characteristic. And the frequency is here, amplitude is there. Of course, you also have, you guessed it, high pass filters. Actually, we will build one because you can build one with the same components you build a low pass filter with. So that's very easy to accomplish. And you can, of course, also combine the two. And then you would have uh, a filter that rejects certain low frequencies and rejects higher frequencies. That would be something that looks like this. And that would be a band pass. 
In this case, there is a uh, part that rejects the low frequencies and a part that rejects the high frequencies. And most filters that you will have in your, uh, uh, that you will have in your uh, setups uh, actually uh, are bandpass filters uh, because usually you want to get rid of the low and the high end, uh, both not just low or high. There's one exception, uh, people who do patch clamping, uh, you basically have a, a low pass filter in your patch clamp rig because you want to measure the membrane uh, rest potential and that's a DC. So if you had a high pass filter, your DC component would be gone and that's exactly part of course that you want to have. So, but usually you will have a band pass filter. And then there is one other filter that you actually should never use. Uh, that's a band reject filter. And we, uh, we already discussed that in uh, the first or second lecture when I said, well, in some cases uh, you are bothered by 60 cycles as a, a noise source in your uh, setup. And, then, and in Europe that would be 50 uh, cycles. And you just cut that frequency uh, out in that case. As a matter of fact, uh, you should uh, avoid getting this uh, noise into your rig by proper grounding uh, procedures. But uh, yeah, in some cases, you already have a recording and you don't want to throw that recording away. In that case, you uh, can use a band reject. You have to uh, realize, though, that since these uh, slopes are never uh, infinitely steep, uh, when you do this, you're cutting in your signal as well. So you're not only cutting your 60 cycles out, but you're really cutting into your, uh, into your signal. Now we are, uh, uh, in this demo, we are going to build uh, a uh, low pass filter and a high pass filter. And we are going to use uh, very simple components. We're going to use an R, a resistor, and we will use one that is 10,000 ohms, 10 kilo ohm. And we will use a uh, capacitor actually a pretty big one from 3.3 microfarad. You would say microfarad, is that a big one? Actually, that's a big one because uh, and, uh, microfarad is, uh, is about the largest uh, uh, type of capacitors that are being used in electronics. If you need bigger ones like that, you need, uh, uh, you need, a, lot of, uh, you need a lot of power to uh, even lift them. So with these two components, we can build both a uh, high-pass and a low-pass filter. And what we are going to do is we are going to do some measurements on these filters. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the analysis of the low-pass filter. And then you have to mimic that analysis for the high-pass filter for your uh, midterm exam. That's your last question. So whatever I'm doing for your low-pass filter, you're basically going to mimic for the high-pass filter for your exam. Well, the low-pass filter uh, typically is, uh, let me use another color here. Your low-pass filter is going to uh, have this configuration. Here is your R, and here is your C. And we're putting something in here, let's say that we call that X, and we are kind of measuring something out there, and we call that Y. And this is a way of drawing it. Uh, you can draw this multiple ways, and it would still be the same thing. You could also, and maybe some of you are more familiar with that, you say, well, I have some kind of an, uh, a potential source X, and then I have an R, and then I have a C, and then I uh, just uh, hook this up like that. And then this is X, and the potential over the capacitor is called Y. That's just a different way of drawing the same thing because X is supposed to be relative to ground and this one is relative to ground so that means that I can basically connect the two lines. Of course you could also uh, take this and just draw it in one line. Huh? You could uh, say oh this is my R, this is my C, and this is my ground, this is my input relative to ground, and this is my output so there are many different ways of drawing this. 
this will be typically the way that you will find it in most physics books. This will be more the way that you will find, or this will be more the way that you will find it in electronic uh, schematics. Because uh, as you can see, by doing this, you can save yourself drawing a, a lot of lines. It's, uh, it's more straightforward. Another thing that I want to mention before we are actually going to uh, look into the filters is that when you have these filter characteristics, it's basically uh, and the, the, the cartoon that I, uh, that I draw here, uh, sometimes people will show also the negative frequencies. Now that can be a little bit confusing because if I, if I start drawing the negative frequencies here, then uh, this thing starts to look like a bandpass filter, see? So if, if something like that happens, uh, uh, if you look at that uh, and you see a low-pass filter, it, mm, this looks like a bandpass filter, have a look at uh, the details, and uh, that means that they simply showed you the negative frequencies. Since these characteristics have even symmetry, you do not get any more information by showing the negative frequencies. So for that reason, uh, I have the habit to just uh, not show them. Okay, then I think we are ready to um, do a little bit of a uh, <coughs> demonstration here. So what we have here on the, on the top part is an, uh, what we call a function generator. So that is our input x that comes out of this box. This is an oscilloscope, basically showing you the graph of the potential versus time. And then here is really the filter. So here is the resistor I'm pointing at. Okay. If you can't see it, just please feel free to go and stand up. Uh, so this is the resistor of uh, 10 kilo ohm. And this is the capacitor, uh, the 3.3 uh, microfarad capacitor. And what, as you can see, I have the input here. And basically, that input is fed to the, uh, in this case, the, the hot part, because black is the ground part. The hot part is fed into the resistor, just as in the diagram on the whiteboard. And then the ground is basically connected to the other side at the capacitor. And then I measure the output of the filter over the capacitor. See, This is where the output is. And so the input is also uh, to this T fed into channel 1 of the oscilloscope. And this output of the filter is fed into channel 2 of the oscilloscope. And right now, if you, uh, if you look at uh, the, the screen here, this is roughly, uh, this is 0.448. So a little bit less than a half a hertz. And you can see on the top, uh, on the top row, you can see the sinusoidal uh, signal. And the bottom, uh, uh, the bottom dot here is the sinusoidal signal coming out of the filter. See? And at 0.4, uh, 0.448 hertz, you can actually see that they are about the same. Right? And that's not unexpected because I have uh, I have put it in the form of a low-pass filter now, and 0.44 hertz is a, is a low frequency. So, so I'm all the way left into the filter characteristic on the, on the whiteboard there. See? Now, now I'm going to uh, show you, and, and of course, and that was uh, what we did in the, in the lab, you would kind of, uh, with very refined steps, you would start measuring what the input and the output was. I'm just going to go with big steps through it to show you what is happening. Uh, and so let's now go and, uh, and multiply the frequency with 10. And now you can see that it is roughly 4.36 4, uh, 4 uh, 4 hertz. And you can already see that uh, a number of things you can actually observe here, very interestingly. The top one is still the input, and the bottom one is the output. And I think you can see that the bottom one, the amplitude is a bit decreased already. Can you see that? If you don't, feel free to. And the do you see something else as well? 
Can you see that the, the bottom one, because they're on the same scale, the bottom oscillation is now a little bit uh, lower in amplitude than the top one. But there is something else also going on. Yes, you're, you're right. There is a little bit of a shift that's called a phase shift. Yeah, exactly. So there are two things happening. Uh, the frequency is attenuated, and there is a little bit of a phase shift. And now, actually, you can see it is not fully attenuated yet, but already a little bit attenuated. So I'm in the transition band of that filter. See? Yes? No? The, the phase shift is uh, actually that's something we have to correct in, the, in, in one of the previous lectures. The, uh, Albert misspoke there about the negative frequency. Uh, um, it is the imaginary part of your Fourier transform that is the shift. Yeah. And let's kind of go one further, one step further. So now I'm at. 43 hertz, and I'll extend the, and now you see I'm really in the stop band now because uh, this is the input, this is the output. You can see the amplitude is quite, uh, quite attenuated, but you can also see that there is a very serious phase shift. You see that? Can you also see it, Kyle? Otherwise, feel free to... Uh, walk around. So I'll show it one more time. Let's go back to uh, the very low frequency. I'm going to uh, change the time scale on the scope, otherwise. Uh, so now we have very low frequency. And you can see there are there is really no phase shift. They are really going equal. And the amplitude is really equal to. Then I, I go a little bit further in the transition band. And now you can see that uh, there is already a little bit of an attenuation. The lower amplitude is a little bit less than the top amplitude. And there is a little bit of phase shift. And now I'm going to go all the way out. And now we get uh, uh, serious uh, attenuation. And of course, if I go uh, 110 further, you can see that uh, now really the attenuation is almost complete. Its filter is, uh, you see, and only these two things are doing this. So you don't need a whole lot to get rid of uh, frequencies that you don't want to. It's, uh, so let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's look at, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the table in chapter 1, or in chapter 10. That's basically uh, this, uh, this table here. You can see here are the frequencies and then here is the low pass amplitude ratio. And uh, I can also express that in uh, decibel, of course, in dB. And here you can see that uh, the result of uh, this particular filter, where we looked at the ratio of input and output for uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 1 hertz, 2 hertz, 5 hertz, 10 hertz, etc. And that would have been, if I, if I did this, uh, which I'm not going to do now because it's just boring. You get, you get the idea. Right? Another thing that's kind of uh, uh, telling for a filter like this is the response to a uh, step, uh, a unit step. And that's actually in the, in the figure next to this table. You can see that if you provide a step to this filter, uh, this filter will not respond with a step but it will respond with a step that's a bit softened. See? And we can actually look at that as well on the, on the screen. Uh, this function generator can also uh, generate uh, block pulses.
So now you have the input is a step, and you, the zero you don't see because it's too fast for the, for the line to draw. But this is a step that occurs at this point in time. And you can see that my, uh, my low-pass filter is basically uh, response with a uh, rounded uh, step uh, function. And you could almost say, well, this is a low-pass filter. So what is the part that uh, this filter has problems with? Well, that's the fast change of this step. That's the, that's the part that this filter cannot follow. It can only follow the low frequencies and the DC of, uh, of its input. So now the only thing that I need to do, believe it or not, <laughs> the only thing that I need to do is to change this low-pass filter into a high-pass filter is uh, interchange the uh, R and the C. So if I, uh, instead of uh, in that diagram over there, if I just flip the positions of the R and the C, now this filter will turn into a high-pass filter. And I can easily do that here as well. I'm, uh, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to flip that position of the R and the C. See? And look what happens with the response to the step. You see what happened? Now this filter said, oh, I love high frequencies, and I do not like low frequencies. So now what you see is it, it actually can follow the quick step, but then as soon as there is DC, as, uh, yeah, it has uh, low frequencies, it has trouble following that and goes back to zero. So that's kind of the, the, the high frequency uh, aspect uh, uh, of this thing. And you see it's the same, uh, the same R and the same C. The only difference is now I feed the hot input to the C, and I measure the output over the R instead of the opposite that I, uh, that I did. And uh, if I now go, po uh, now go to uh, sinusoidal signals, of course, I'm going to find uh, if I look at the frequency characteristic, I'm not going to find that one, but I'm going to find the high pass one. I'm going to find out that uh, the low frequencies are going to be attenuated, whereas the high frequencies are not going to be attenuated. So let's check that. Let's kind of go to high frequencies first. And let's kind of put this into a sine wave mode. And now you can see that indeed uh, high frequencies, uh, no problem. See? It follows nicely the high frequency uh, uh, that I give at the input, it also comes at the output. Eh? So the top again is the input, bottom is again the output. Now, of course, the opposite is going to happen when I'm going to go to a low frequencies. I'm going to get some, uh, some attenuation. You can already see a little bit of attenuation here. And you can also see, again, a little bit of phase shift, I think. And they're not entirely synchronized, the two dots. And if I go even lower, I should, uh, so now you see that uh, the top one is basically the input. And you see that uh, there's a little bit of output there, but that's uh, basically very, very attenuated. So now I'm doing the, uh, now I've been doing the, uh, the opposite. Uh, uh, in creating, uh, you can actually, if you have an, uh, a measurement rig and you have at some point in time you have problem with a certain frequency, you can actually uh, uh, very easily make your own filter. If you want to test, oh, what does the signal look like? Uh, you, this this thing cost uh, in total maybe less than uh, fifty cents, so it's cheap. It's really cheap. Oh, in, thi in this case, the, the phase shift will be, uh, yeah, you can, you can, we will actually get to that, how you can compute that, and how you can get that from the, so that, that'll be one of the things we'll have a look at, so. Okay. 
him. So instead of giving you a global answer, I will give you a precise answer in a little bit. Is this uh, principle clear? So we have a uh, low pass filter, high pass filter. Uh, you can characterize that by putting in a lots and lots of frequencies in there and then just measure that graph, which is a lot of work, but in principle not very difficult. Uh, 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 and on the other hand, you can characterize that filter by giving it a step. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you give it a step, you can, uh, you can either uh, get this soft response or you can get this sharp response uh, of, the, of the filter. And with that, you have characterized it uh, then. If that's clear, then we're going to talk a little bit further on the whiteboard uh, on uh, how, we, uh, how we can analyze this. And before I do that, I also want to make, uh, uh, make the point that uh, the difference between a filter and a an, uh, model is not always that big. I mean, uh, uh, for instance, that low-pass filter, the way that I, uh, the way that I uh, uh, represented it uh, uh, in this one, could say, well, this is a, uh, uh, a low-pass filter. I could also say, well, this is actually not a bad model for a synapse. Then this would be the synaptic uh, current that's being injected. And this R and this C would be the, uh, uh, would be the uh, R and the C of the uh, membrane. So this, you could say, well, this is kind of a simplified model of, uh, of a synaptic uh, current uh, uh, in, an, uh, in a biological membrane. So for that reason, if somebody says filter, you can sometimes just, just as well think, oh, that's kind of, an, uh, kind of a model. Since for now I'm going to write on the whiteboard, if you find it more comfortable to sit there, feel free to do that. I'm going to make a little bit of space before I continue. has two advantages. Uh, you see better and you don't get distracted by the Chicago skyline, which is uh, looking really uh, nice today. So in general, we have analog and digital filters. And what you see here is an analog filter. Eh? It's not, uh, it didn't require any programming in a computer. We didn't even need a computer. You just use analog uh, components. And uh, in this case, uh, Let's, let's have a look at, uh, uh, at this particular uh, low-pass filter that we, uh, that we started out with. And I'm going to now draw it, draw it like this. This was the input. And this is my output. This is my R. This is my C. And this is my current, I. And let's first analyze this thing in continuous time. And by the way, if you uh, want to read this a little bit further, this, this whole analysis uh, you can find in uh, chapter 11. So let me ask you this first. I am drawing a current here. Uh, why am I not drawing a current there? So I just pretend there is only current here. But I have a node here, so why is not current also going this way? You have any idea? Mm -hmm. uh, 
oh, but it will be because I am going to measure y. So I need to connect something to measure it. So if nothing else, I'm going to have an oscilloscope or a voltmeter there. There you go. That's the right answer. Yeah, that's the right answer. So think back of one of the first lectures when we said when you hook up pieces of equipment, always make sure that the input impedance of your measurement equipment is much higher than the output resistance of what you're measuring. And because of that, you can there will be a little bit of current here when you measure, but it will be negligible. Yeah. Now, from this to the equation is always a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, you just play a little bit around with uh, Kirchhoff's law and uh, with Ohm's law. In this case, uh, you can say that uh, y, the output, is nothing else than the input minus the voltage drop over the resistor, isn't it? So I have some input x here, and then I have some voltage drop over the resistor, and that will be equal to y. And that is called uh, Kirchhoff's uh, second law, isn't it? Because Kirchhoff's second law says that, well, basically, if you go around in, an, uh, in a circuit, uh, the potentials basically have to add up to zero. And uh, if, I, uh, if I make this circuit closed, that means that this potential plus this one plus that one have to add up to zero. And uh, that means that uh, since this is the source and this is drops over the, then you get this, uh, this equation. And if you apply Ohm's law for the second part, then I can write it like this, isn't it? Vr is nothing else than the current times the resistance. That's Ohm's law. So now I applied the second law of Kirchhoff, and I applied Ohm's law, basically. And then there is one more that I need to, uh, uh, that I need to uh, use, which is uh, this equation for the capacitor. that the charge is the product of uh, the capacitance times the potential. And in this case, uh, uh, I have to realize that the derivative of the charge is the current. Huh? So. The derivative I now indicate as uh, Q dot. And so that means that uh, I can say that uh, The current is equal to the product of C and Y dot, eh? comparing these two. And if I now combine that, I get my uh, my differential equation of my uh, linear system. And this is called a first order uh, ordinary differential equation with a force term. Eh? It's first order because there is only a first order derivative. And there is a force term because x is not 0. That's, um now, you can solve this in uh, the time domain. If you want to read how to do that. Uh, you can read that on uh, page 178. You can also directly uh, solve this in the frequency domain. You can read that on the next page. And what's important there is that you uh, realize that in that case, instead of dealing with a uh, resistance here, we now deal with an impedance. And uh, an impedance in this case, uh, uh, for a resistance, a resistor is actually very simple. It's just R. But for a uh, capacitance, the impedance, indicated by the capital Z, is 1 over J omega C. So that's a complex uh, uh, number. And then you can uh, further solve this as you will uh, you can read it. That's pretty straightforward uh, algebra. 
that's basically an, uh, an adaptation of Ohm's law. Instead of V is equal I times R, you now say V is equal I times Z. Huh? Well, these are boring ways of solving them. Uh, a more interesting way of solving them uh, in our case is to uh, apply the, the newly uh, learned techniques, and that is using the Laplace uh, or Fourier uh, method. And let's just uh, apply what we uh, have been uh, looking at. Uh, um, in this case, uh, um, we are going to determine first uh, the unit impulse response of this system. Because if we know the unit impulse response of this system, we know the system, isn't it? And we can basically uh, compute anything we like. So let's uh, use, uh, uh, let's take, uh, for x, we are going to use the uh, unit impulse. My function generator cannot really do that. Uh, I could give it a very brief pulse, but uh, unit impulse, of course, is not, uh, is not uh, something that's uh, feasible physically. For that reason, we usually take a step. Uh, that's, that's a lot easier to realize. And <coughs> realize then that uh, the Laplace transform of the unit uh, impulse is uh, one. Huh? Makes life so easy. So that means that when I now translate this equation into the Laplace domain, I can say, well, it's going to be RC, that's just a constant. And then Y dot is going to be uh, S y s is it and i'm going to assume that uh, uh, at time zero basically at my initial condition is uh, is zero which is reasonable because i said i was going to give it a unit impulse now this one is easy plus y s and that is equal to one so that means that uh, from this i uh, find that ys in this case is equal to hs by definition because I fed it in a unit impulse is 1 over rcs. So this is the transfer function. Huh? This is in the Laplace domain. If I had done this in the Fourier domain, any uh, educated guess what I would have found? Yeah. You could, of course, repeat the whole thing in the Fourier domain, but really not necessary in this case. By the Fourier, we are using Y omega. And by Laplace, we are using S, which is a real part plus Y omega, isn't it? So if in the Fourier domain, it's not always true, but very often you can just say that uh, I would have found in this case Now this is the frequency response, and this is the transfer function. And as a matter of fact, if you uh, use the table, you can, uh, well, I cannot get rid of these. Uh, very easily, so I'll push it down. If I uh, use the table on these two, I would have found that in the time domain, this corresponds to
to this thing, which is something we saw the previous lecture as well. So this is the uh, unit impulse response. This is the transfer function. And this is the frequency uh, response or frequency characteristic. And now you can already see a little bit where this uh, is going to lead us because what we just saw as the, the characteristic of this filter was just uh, the, the absolute value of this thing as a function of frequency. And since this is a complex number, the, basically the phase that this is giving is giving me the phase distortion. Uh, we're we're going to come to that now. But that's basically how you compute what a phase distortion is. So, but that's, uh, in, in a way, we just looked at this thing and said, well, we realize this is an LTI system. So, we just need to know what is the uh, differential equation or the dynamics that governs this system. Well, this in this case, it's not too difficult. We just use uh, Kirchhoff and Ohm and uh, the law for the capacitance, and we come up with an, uh, with an, uh, an, uh, an ODE that governs this, uh, this whole thing. And then we just pick a way of solving this uh, equation. And uh, yeah, usually this is, uh, certainly when you use tables, is very easy. You, uh, you give it uh, the unit impulse, so you set the output to 1. You translate this thing into the uh, into the uh, Laplace domain, which is really easy because now the derivative is just uh, Laplace transform times s. You algebraically solve this, you get the transfer function. And by uh, by uh, substituting s for j omega, you get for free. Uh, you could redo the whole thing, of course, in uh, with with the Fourier transform. You get the whole frequency response. And then if you use the tables, you can actually uh, 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 get uh, the unit impulse response. Yeah? So, now the next question is, um, we didn't give it a unit impulse response, we gave it a step, isn't it? So how do we deal, now we want to know what is the output to a step. So we now know what it does here. But we would like to know what happens if <coughs> I'm using now the, the symbol theta for uh, what happens if we give it a step. We're not going to do this in detail. You, you can actually uh, look that up uh, uh, in the book. It's kind of stepwise uh, explained how the step function is. Uh, is having an effect on this filter, but let's kind of talk about in principle, because in principle it's very simple. Right? If you have an LTI system and you know all these functions, the transfer function, the frequency uh, response, and the unit impulse, so now I want to know what is the output to some arbitrary function. So now I want to have some arbitrary function. In the time domain, it would simply be, and in this case, uh, x would be theta, is it? Uh, would be the step function. So convolution, that would do it in the time domain. In the Laplace domain, It would be this, isn't it? And in the uh, frequency domain, yeah, and I'm drawing this ridiculous data to indicate that that is the transform. So this is all in the time domain, and these are all in the <coughs> S and the J omega domains. Huh? Now, the only thing you need to know now 
and you can actually compute that, but also pick the table, is that you, uh, you need to know that uh, uh, in this case, uh, we are dealing with uh, a uh, Laplace transform that's 1 over s. Or here it's 1 over j omega. So that means that uh, I would just, uh, let's kind of stay in the Laplace domain, doesn't really matter. I just multiply this thing with 1 over s, and then I transform it back into the time domain. And in order to do that, you need to do some partial fraction expansion. But uh, you can actually, uh, that's part of the, what I want you to do for the homework, is that on uh, pages 180 and 181, you can see what happens. Uh, you can see step by step how to do that. But the principle is not difficult. Once you have that, you just multiply in the symbolic domain. Or if you feel compelled to do a convolution, you do convolution in the time domain. That clear? And then if you did it right, you should basically now uh, get the output that we saw on the oscilloscope. You should basically see that, oh yeah, when you give it a step, I actually should get something that, uh, that looks like an, uh, a rounded step. So, so in other words, if I, uh, if I give this a uh, step here, my expectation is that I will find some uh, rounded step there. And you will see that that is indeed the outcome. At the very least, we are at the University of Chicago, isn't it? So this may all work in practice, and that's all fine. But the most important part is how does it hold up theoretically? And really, it does. Yeah. So. Um, I mentioned that uh, we were going to do this uh, in continuous time. And I put a 1 here. so. That means we will also have a look at it in uh, discrete time. And once we have done that, uh, we will uh, leave it for this day and then come back to this uh, in more detail uh, the next lecture because then we're going to really look at analyzing this uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit further. But this, this should be enough to get you started on the, uh, this should uh, be enough to get you started on your uh, midterm exam. So in the discrete time, let's say that we are using a, a time step uh, that is uh, really small. In that case, uh, I am going to just discretize my, uh, my ODE. It's kind of an, uh, an easy way of doing it. Uh, I'm going to say uh, xn is rc, yn minus yn minus 1, divided by delta t plus yn. So I just basically took that equation there, uh, this one over here, and I made it, uh, made it discrete. I'm going to uh, s uh, simplify notation by using uh, this thing. And you can see that, that by definition, a has to be a big number. So that's also a reason to use this number a. Because if your number a is not really a big number, then whatever you're doing here is not completely legitimate. And the smaller a is, uh, the more this is going to deviate from, uh, uh, 
from approximating the real thing in, uh, in continuous time. If I do that, I uh, can now solve yn from this uh, equation. And again, the way that you, uh, you can also uh, compute with this stuff very easily, you can either uh, simulate it, of course, very easily in MATLAB, which is something uh, that uh, you also will do for your uh, homework. Um, but you, uh, sometimes you also want to compute with it, and then you can do the same thing as there. You can translate it into the Laplace domain, or in this case, since it is discrete time, the Z domain. And again, this would be the transfer function. This is, by the way, also the way that some, some books on filters will uh, present the, the, the filter. I'll show you. Uh, what that looks like then. it for figure 11.3 if you um, I don't know you can probably not see it from uh, where you are sitting so you can look in your own book but it's figure 11.3 uh, on page 182 you can see that uh, there is the input and there is this uh, 1 over a plus 1 which is this uh, term here to the input and then there is the uh, y with the z minus 1 uh, which is basically this uh, term uh, multiplied by a over a plus 1, which is this part. And that is being fed back here. And that's kind of an, uh, a graphical way of showing you this, uh, this equation. And that's sometimes what you will see in, uh, in the more technical literature. Or if you have literature uh, describing your uh, measurement equipment uh, or digital filters, then something like that may be, uh, may be used. And, and so you see it's, it's just a different way of using an equation, so the diagram. So that brings me to the homework, which is that I want you to, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, I want you to uh, go through these steps and make sure that you understand these, how you go from... Uh, uh, understanding what the filter is doing on a uh, unit impulse uh, and then compute what the, what the thing is on the unit step. And the second thing that I want you to do is to uh, do this, uh, uh, this example on page 182. And, um, and just do that example, plot it out, plot the result out, and, uh, and kind of make a little description to kind of indicate to us that you understood what, uh, what's going on there. Because the end result of this whole thing uh, on, the, on that page will be in uh, a bunch of graphs superimposed. So make a little kind of legend with the graph uh, 
to uh, indicate what's what. Huh? So that's it for now. Is there any, and, and I, I, I come back further on this, uh, this whole uh, phase thing, so but uh, is there anything at this point that uh, you want to ask before we finish this? Uh, then we're done. <laughs>